All right. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for uh, having me here today and for the very kind invitation to be sharing with you a number of ideas uh, in the area of uh, criminology and criminal justice and particularly uh, in uh, public opinion. Let me first of all thank the, uh, the organizers, uh, the Australian Institute of Criminology uh, in particular and the ANZOC, uh, Australian <coughs> New Zealand Society of Criminology, uh, for their enthusiastic support for this particular idea to organize a World Crime Forum today. Uh, the idea started a little bit as a wild idea over dinner, as many of uh, wild ideas and uh, sometimes good ideas do start. And the idea had been to sort of model uh, after the World Economic Forum something related to crime. However, the World Economic Forum, of course, brings together all these people in one place at one particular time uh, in a fancy Swiss uh, ski resort. So we said, well, as an international scientific organization, we may not do the same, but we may do many other things. In fact, uh, localizing, if you wish, uh, crime and criminal justice issues and try to uh, be present in several parts of the world. Uh, in fact, in all parts of the world, because the aim was to have world crime forums in uh, each of the continents. And uh, we've been successful. Uh, and I'm very proud, actually, to, uh, to announce today that today is uh, the final, uh, let's say, realization of that dream, because so far we've had we had gotten to uh, four continents. Today we're covering the fifth. Isn't that wonderful? And you being part of this. <laughs> All right. Um, the topic of today deals with um, public opinion and uh, public perceptions of, um, of crime, criminal justice, fear of crime partially as well and possibly what to do about that, both from the perspective of policymakers and from the perspective of uh, researchers. And you will not be surprised that um, I will uh, try to talk a little bit about <coughs> research that has been conducted in Europe, um, and in particular uh, in Belgium, but I will not limit it to Belgium, obviously. I will try to put the Belgian uh, data into a European context. Now, why is this uh, the case? Because, as was uh, said in the introduction, uh, increasingly governments of Western countries, Western industrialized countries, let's say, and particularly also European countries, are being faced with a number of very serious issues. Uh, lack of trust in the judicial uh, system, and it is argued that because of that, many people would not actually want to cooperate with the judicial system and the police in the first place. If they don't trust the police or the judges, why would they go to court? Uh, why would they actually report crime? So it also has, a, of course, a very uh, strong impact, or it may have a strong impact on behavior. So in order to, um, to deal with these uh, issues, as was rightly said, uh, some European systems have uh, started to conduct research to understand how people think about the justice system, what their recall is and how that may have an impact on their uh, conduct, on their uh, behavior. And this was not different in Belgium either a number of years ago. So what I'm briefly going to do is introduce a particular research agenda that was started, uh, let's say, about 15 years ago in the small country that I come from, densely populated and uh, split in uh, two or in three or in many layers. Um, uh, but um, and, and report on some of the uh, major results, let's say, of that particular research. Now, in doing so, I hope to be able to demonstrate or to highlight uh, a number of key issues when it comes to doing research uh, of this type on this area. Uh, and it is my firm belief that if you look at various types of research that have been conducted uh, throughout Europe and maybe uh, even in, in different parts of the world, that they all face the same issues, the same problems. Who to reach, how to reach them, how to ask questions, how to make sense of the results, and how to translate that into policy making. So I will try to highlight some of these issues, um, starting from a Belgian context, but then moving towards uh, a European uh, context and um, putting the Belgian data in, in the context of Euro the European uh, countries. In the third point, I would like to uh, highlight a little bit of uh, um, what I would call the empirical cycle, um, because these justice barometers, as they were called, and they are called today, are quantitative researchers. And I think everyone in the rooms knows what the strengths are of quantitative research, but also what the limitations are. 
So the question is, can we come up as research community with a more sophisticated model in which we try to grasp the opinions and attitudes and expectations of people uh, through an empirical cycle that would combine quantitative and qualitative work. So we'll try to uh, deal a little bit with that. And then finally ask some questions and raise some issues in relationship to, the, um, to policy making because obviously policy makers are very interested to know what comes out of our research and what can we actually do um, about this. So this is the, the menu for, um, for my presentation. Um, I already gave away the first uh, bullet point by saying that um, uh, Western democracies have become very interested in dealing with these kind of issues. In fact, uh, one could even say that in certain countries there has been a crisis of the uh, criminal justice system. Crises for several reasons. In my particular country, Belgium, it had to do a lot with a number of unresolved high-profile criminal cases. Um, I don't think you may be familiar with some of them, but uh, maybe the Marc Dutroux case may ring a bell. This was a, a person who was, uh, well, a pedophile and was suspected of having killed a number of young girls, uh, which he actually abducted and then uh, killed in his uh, basement, in fact. And these images have gone uh, all over the world. Uh, and when the police investigation was done to actually understand how this could have happened, uh, it became very clear that the police forces had not been communicating with one another. Uh, and at that time in Belgium, there were three different kinds of police forces, imagine, for a small country uh, like this one. Uh, so it really created a lot of distrust uh, whether police were actually taking care in any way of the preoccupations of the citizens and so on and so forth. <coughs> so um, these crises uh, are have to do with legitimacy of the system. They also have to do with the effectiveness of the system and the kinds of proposals that were made by Adam uh, just a minute ago, all relate to that. How to build up that trust, how to increase the effectiveness of the uh, criminal justice systems. Uh, in this respect, I think public opinion is starting to serve another purpose. It used to be a very theoretical exercise to be wanting to know what the public thought, because at the end of the day, nobody would do much uh, about uh, the results or with the results. And it used to be, I uh, remember in the early days of sociology of law in the 1960s and 70s, in Scandinavia there used to be a lot of research called COL research, knowledge and opinion about law, K-O-L. But that's what, that was very much an academic exercise. Uh, we want to know what people think because we think it's important to understand how legal consciousness is being uh, constituted. Now with these crises and these uh, rapid societal developments in many countries in, uh, in Western Europe at least, um, I think the idea of public opinion is gaining further ground, but then in a more policy-oriented and a practical uh, way. So another reason, in fact a very good reason, to try to think ahead and to see how these uh, results, how these research findings can be translated into policy making. I'm going to report a little bit about um, Belgium, as I said, to start with, and I would call it a decade, maybe it's a little bit more by now, uh, but within that um, comparative uh, perspective. So first of all, um, a number of uh, data relating to the justice barometers, as uh, uh, they have been called. And um, I will disclose today in a public forum that the idea of a justice barometer, the name itself, comes from the Spanish uh, way of dealing with uh, this kind of research. Uh, Barometro de la Justicia, they call it there. And it's actually a fantastic uh, set of, uh, of data that they have been collected. And you may wonder why Spain uh, isn't Southern Europe usually known for not being very research intensive? Uh, apologies to the audience. Uh, well, in this case, no, not at all, because they had a very good reason. When uh, General Franco left office and democracy came back to Spain, in fact, the public uh, opinion uh, policymakers wanted to know how do people change their minds? How are they now looking at the uh, justice system? Uh, one that may have created distrust in the past, is it gaining trust in uh, the future? So from the early days on of democracy in Spain, they actually started to build these barometers and they have a, a massive and, and very uh, interesting and impressive set of, uh, of data there. Now, um, the idea of a justice barometer in Belgium came in, um, 
at, uh, in the, the, the mid-1990s, uh, in fact, where a, a private foundation, the King Baudouin Foundation, which was uh, uh, mentioned earlier, uh, and which is a foundation that does a lot of uh, research and actually commissions research in all kinds of, uh, of societal fields, uh, that foundation actually wanted to set up a big uh, research because they thought it had not been done before in Belgium and it was high time. Uh, uh, feeling the tide of the, uh, uh, let's say, of the, of the crisis uh, roaming in the country. Uh, however, the foundation could not do it on its own. It provided a lot of the funds, but commissioned and sort of subcontracted the uh, particular project to the Federal Science Policy um, Institute, which then carried out the research. And uh, we were lucky enough as uh, teams from the University of Leuven and Liège to be able uh, to carry out that particular research. So um, let me move on here. The first justice barometer was actually held in uh, 2002, in a <coughs> two-month period, September, October of 2002. And uh, here already a uh, first element arises. Uh, it's very important, uh, as, as you know, to keep the period as short as possible. Uh, to sort of avoid intervening factors or external factors that may start changing the ideas of people as you go along in trying to uh, contact them and uh, solicit their opinions. Um, in um, two, on two other occasions, uh, the Justice Barometer has been repeated in 2007 and 2010, however, not by academic teams, but by um, uh, a private firm that was commissioned to do so by the High Council of Justice with funds from the Parliament. So funding has shifted over the years. Uh, the type of agencies uh, involved in executing or carrying out the research has also shifted. But the basic model is uh, still there. And in fact, the basic questionnaires are still being used. This is a quantitative type of research. And here is a little bit of the, uh, of the model, of the theoretical uh, model, the conceptual model. Um, the, the basic idea has been, like in many uh, types of, uh, of this sort of research, to uh, understand attitudes, to understand attitudes of the population in relation to the justice system. Uh, maybe I can use the pointer here. And uh, of course, the first question is, what is an attitude? Uh, so mm, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, this kind of literature. We used uh, the conception that attitudes are composed of three elements, three aspects, one being a cognitive element that has to do with knowledge about a certain area, uh, the second being an affective, uh, affective element that has to do with feelings towards the object, and third one is a behavioral element that has to do with behavior, with um, the way in which people conduct themselves. And so this is the conglomerate, let's say, of attitudes uh, so in the research, we try to ask questions related to each of these three aspects. Now, uh, immediately I can say that it's easier to measure cognitive and affective elements than it is to measure behavioral elements. In fact, what, we, what you measure in, uh, often in those cases is, is the intent to uh, behave in a certain way. But it's extremely difficult, of course, to check that, whether it's actually true or not. Um, when it comes to the object of the research, uh, we talk in very easy terms about justice, and in fact this was a large uh, research uh, not only on uh, criminal justice but also uh, partly on civil justice matters. I will only report on the criminal justice aspects today uh, because justice is a set of institutions, it's a set of procedures, there are actors involved, there is policy making involved, so in fact one needs to break it down further to understand what exactly justice means. Otherwise, you run the risk of asking very general questions about very general things, but not being able to really pinpoint what exactly the object of the research and therefore the understanding of uh, the respondents is. And when it came to understanding uh, or trying to understand what are some of the determining factors that uh, the independent variables, uh, if you wish, that determine the attitude towards the justice system, we came up with three sets um, the middle set is, is very well known, socio-demographic, uh, age, gender, educational background, uh, socio-economic background. Um, then also the, the political alignment and the media use of the respondents. Uh, which kind of newspapers do they read? Which kind of programs do they watch? And finally, uh, what is their knowledge level? Uh, 
to start with of the justice system and what are their experiences. And I can already disclose at this point that experiences are very important according to the research uh, data that we have uh, been able to gather. Uh, in the classical research, you start with a literature review, elaborate the model, test the model uh, with all kinds of face-to-face uh, -face interviews first and then uh, telephone interviews as a test. So we did all of that um, and then came up with, um, with the following sample of uh, 3,200 respondents, but not without having made 20,000 odd telephone calls. Mm. This is a telephone interview. Uh, so imagine, this is, um, this is not nothing, it's a lot. And uh, uh, in, in terms of the research team, uh, just to make <laughs> things clear, we didn't carry out these telephone interviews ourselves. We actually asked the firm to help us doing that, uh, but keeping a very close contact with the firm um, and with the company and trying to, to make sure that uh, things were going well. And they have done a very good job, I think. Uh, so roughly speaking, we're talking about computer-assisted uh, interviewing of about 30 minutes, the shortest being 20, the largest or the longest being about 40 <coughs> minutes um, uh, telephone interviews. And then all kinds of validation criteria apply in terms of population, um, in terms of gender and, uh, and age and so on and so forth. Okay, um, I'm going to report on a number of results, not too many, not to overload uh, this, uh, this particular panel, but a number of key results. And um, they will always be structured according to the following colors and uh, systems. So um, if you see something green, it means yes. Uh, if it's dark green, it means very much yes. Uh, if it's uh, towards orange or red, it means no. And it's, uh, if it's really dark red, it means uh, definitely no. And there is always that uh, category of non-response uh, uh, or people who uh, are not uh, having any opinion or don't want to express it. By the way, the idea of opinion is sometimes very tricky. What's the difference between an attitude and an opinion? In fact, we took it very uh, pragmatically by saying uh, an attitude is an underlying element and the opinion is the expression of the attitude, just to make it a little bit simple. And I'm not sure if that would relate in the same way to some of your research. In fact, we did find out uh, when looking at in a comparative perspective that the definitions may sometimes differ. And in other words, the kinds of results uh, are heavily dependent on the type of, uh, of methodology used, but also the kinds of concepts used. And that makes it extremely difficult and very, um, uh, uh, how shall I say, also uh, w with the, the need to be very prudent uh, to compare and to just uh, throw around uh, certain figures because we first have to know how they were uh, um, collected and what they actually uh, uh, mean, what they actually represent. So a number of data on the confidence in the justice system. Mind you, this is 2002, six years after this Dutru case uh, erupted and a couple of years after it became very clear that the police was not doing a very good job. In the meantime, the police had been reformed and was brought together into one big police force for the whole country. So this is the, uh, the first question, I think a question which is very uh, similar and, and, and familiar to you because it's the kind of question that is often posed in this kind of research. Do you have confidence or what kind of confidence do you have in the justice system? Uh, you will not be surprised to see that at that moment, 2002, there was a lot of distrust. In fact, distrust is higher very clearly than the uh, trust is. And uh, you can imagine when we presented these results uh, at a press conference, you can imagine what the headlines of the newspapers were the next day. In fact, they were very double. Uh, some said, listen, isn't that incredible? 75% um, of the Belgian population is not trusting uh, the criminal justice system. What do you expect? The other newspaper said, it's wonderful, isn't it? Huh? Because still 43% is trusting the criminal justice system. Um, the thing is, of course, this was the baseline study and we didn't have any comparative results. We had a little bit of qualitative results with very small pockets of groups uh, earlier on, but ac actually nothing to compare with. So here are the journalists starting to make up their own stories, whether this is good or bad, whether this is an increase or a decrease. In fact, the only thing which is possible for researchers to say is we don't know. The only thing we know is what we have now and from this we will build in the future. And that's also why it's so important, I think, to have these kind of studies in a recurrent perspective, uh, to, um, 
to repeat them at, uh, at regular intervals. Now, um, what, what is interesting, of course, in a country, well, in any country, but definitely in a country which is so separated by language and increasingly by culture, is to see whether there is a, a difference between the regions and the, the level of trust in the regions. And I'm sorry to have uh, uh, included here some uh, French uh, names still. It just has to do with my complete incapacity and inability to deal with technical issues. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm sure I'm in good company here today. Uh, but so for the country itself, uh, here are the, the final data, the aggregate data, and then of course Flanders, it says there on the left, and then Brussels and Wallonia, uh, Wallonia being the French-speaking part of uh, Belgium, Brussels being the capital region where bilingual, um, bilingualism is, uh, is upheld. So in fact what you see there is uh, that in Flanders the trust is higher, <coughs> and in Wallonia and Brussels the trust is lower. However, the differences between Wallonia and Brussels are not of that sort to be sufficiently significant, and therefore you see the framework around it, meaning, well, in fact, we have to, to take them together because we cannot exclude the uh, effect of coincidence there. Uh, so an, another way of thinking is, how come? Why is this the case, that in certain parts of the country it's uh, even under that particular median or that mean, uh, that average, and in other parts it's uh, higher? Comparison with other institutions, uh, we try to look at um, how does the justice system relate in, uh, in the, the broad sense of the word with a number of other institutions. Again, it's in French, here it says enseignement, um, that's educational system, as you can see a lot of green there, uh, and that is by the way consistent with many findings in other European countries that usually the educational systems uh, tend to be highly trusted uh, and highly uh, valuable in the eyes of the population. Um, on the other side, you see the church, église, you see the press, uh, the, the media, let's say, where it says press, and you see the justice system. Again, with a frame, uh, because it's very hard uh, in significant terms, statistically significant terms, to make that distinction. So basically we said, okay, we'll take them all together. And in between, you see uh, two other institutions, um, the police and the parliament. Uh, and there you see a little bit of a shaded um, view here uh, because the police obviously has less trust or receives less trust in 2002 from the population than the uh, um, educational system. However, we were a little bit surprised uh, given the background of this story and given the fact that all this information had come out. So why is it that four years only uh, or six years after this uh, complete disaster that, that uh, shocked the country enormously, the police is still uh, over 65% uh, in terms of trust. The parliament, on the other hand, is a bit lower and in fact in later years has even uh, lowered enormously because we had this uh, very interesting social experiment, as you know, of having been a country uh, without a government for 536 days. Uh, it also has advantages, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so here are some of these data. It's definitely clear the justice system is towards the lower end of the institutions receiving uh, trust. Now, here are some general trends which we came up with on the basis of statistical analysis. How do you explain the level of trust? Well, the level of trust is lower as age goes on. Um, Okay, that's a, that's, a, that's a given from the data. Uh, the other question is how to explain that. Um, it increases with the level of instruction. In other words, the level of education. Interesting. It increases with the income, and there might be connection between those two. People with higher uh, degrees or better education get better jobs. It is higher with men than it is with women. It's uh, larger or higher with persons possessing a remuner remunerated job uh, uh, in other words, uh, income is, is a general category. To have a job uh, with a salary is a specific category because you can al also uh, live on social uh, assistance or subsistence uh, allowances, obviously, or part of them. Uh, some other general trends, uh, people linked to the justice system have significantly higher degrees of trust vis-a-vis uh, -vis others. That may not be so surprising, but it's an interesting um, uh, finding. And here is a very important finding, probably one of the strongest that we came up with. The lowest trust was found with people having a personal experience with the criminal justice system. 
And this was both the case in civil and in criminal justice. In criminal justice, you could even say, well, uh, in fact, you don't have a choice to go to the criminal justice system. You're being called as a witness, as a victim, or as a suspect. But also in civil cases where people voluntarily decide to bring a case to a court, it was uh, significantly lower. Now, this is an interesting given, and I think this is also very much in line with what other European um, data uh, show us. We're not sure about the last one. Uh, it's very weak or the weakest with people living um, on their own or after a divorce. Uh, one hypothesis could be that um, people are really thrown back on their own, have a few uh, social networks or a, a more restricted social network, and it may create more distrust either in life or in particular institutions. Uh, again, this is an interesting one. It is uh, higher the trust with people reading the so-called information or uh, we find it very hard to call it quality press because it's very difficult to find good criteria to make distinctions between quality press and other types of press, but information press and public radio and TV. Um, when it comes to political parties, extreme political parties, both to the right and to the left, um, uh, seem to be connected with f uh, lower levels of trust uh, with their, uh, their members. Mm. The question is always in which direction is the uh, is the causality uh, going or the relationship going. Now, in a country where Catholics and Protestants are, uh, uh, are indeed um, also uh, living, uh, it was surprising for us to know that Catholics have higher degrees of trust than Protestants. And then, of course, as you can imagine, it differs significantly according to the judicial district, which was a reason later on to conduct some qualitative research in these um, districts. Here is another kind of figure which shows how the level of trust has uh, developed over the years. 2002, uh, the particular figure. In 2007, look at that. That's an enormous increase. It's basically a 50% increase. Uh, and in 2010, there's a decrease, yes, but not an enormous decrease. Still, at the end of the day, 2010, and uh, we will see when the next uh, round will take place, uh, it's around 60%, let's say. It's not uncommon for European countries. Uh, it's not the best. It's not the lowest either. Uh, because, no, I will, uh, well, I'll, I will show that slide uh, later on. And here you see the evolution in each of the other institutions I was talking about with the, uh, uh, the uh, blue uh, uh, color representing the first uh, justice barometer results. Uh, then the green one, the last of 2010, and then the middle one, the one of 2007. So you basically see um, in education there's very little difference. It actually goes up a little bit. In police, interestingly enough, it does go up uh, as time goes by. Very interesting. Parliament, here you are. Uh, uh, it did go up and then went down, uh, obviously, and that had to do with that political crisis. At least that would be our understanding. And in the justice system, it did go up enormously. In fact, it's one of the um, institutions that is, uh, uh, is on the rise uh, in, in the two first barometers. The press goes up a little bit, and the religious institutions have also decreased. Uh, this may have to do with uh, some of the scandals related to the, um, to the evidence of sexual abuse in the church, uh, which, of course, is not typically Belgium. It uh, has been taking place in several parts of the world. But that came out very closely in 2009 in order to be influencing public opinion, I'm sure, the year after. Now, here you have a little bit of data from a European perspective. Again, apologies for the, the titles, which in this case are in Dutch. Uh, so this is a multilingual uh, environment <laughs> uh, as, a, as a World Society for Criminology should be. Um, what you see here is, it, it says evolution of the trust, the confidence, and we use the, the terms uh, interchangeably in the uh, judicial system. So BE is Belgium, and then you have the whole range of countries, uh, Switzerland, Germany, Denmark, Spain, Finland, France, uh, United Kingdom, or Great Britain, it's, ca it's called here, Hungary, Holland, Norway, Poland, Portugal, Spain, and uh, Slovenia. Um, and, uh, well, this is, of course, a very instructive uh, type of, uh, of table or graph because here you see the evolutions not only 
across the countries, but also across the time frames. 2002, unfortunately, is not in color, uh, being, of course, the left one, and 2008 being the right uh, element. So there you see that, for example, countries like Denmark and Finland, and to a certain extent Norway, the Scandinavian countries, which are always very scoring very highly on whatever kind of index, um, also stand out. And particularly Denmark and Finland, um, because this is measuring the degree of uh, percentage expressing a very strong confidence in the system. Not only confidence, because it would be much higher, but very strong confidence, uh, ranging up to 30, 35% in uh, some Scandinavian countries. In Belgium, it is lower than five. And in the Netherlands, which uh, is, is for us of, of often a comparison uh, country, it is uh, slightly higher than five, but not so much higher. Uh, um, and then some countries in between, like, uh, like uh, Spain or Switzerland or Germany, they're somewhere in between around 10%, the hardcore of uh, believers, I would call them. Uh, here again, something similar, but put in a different way. This is about confidence in the police and justice system in a comparative perspective, whereby the police is represented by the green uh, color and the justice system by the uh, purple color. And uh, here you can see um, percentages actually ranging down, uh, with the highest being, again, Denmark and Finland, and Norway and Sweden, so very consistent. Then Switzerland, and here uh, Holland is, uh, is, uh, is in, the, in the top group, let's say. This is also the percentage that says, yes, I have a strong confidence in the police and justice system. Belgium, as you uh, see, in fact, I should use a pointer. Uh, Belgium is here, mm. so somewhere in the middle, which is uh, very much uh, like all the kind of data uh, of research are showing, very much in the middle. And then a number of other countries, uh, Eastern European and Southern European, uh, towards that end. Uh, Spain, Poland, the Czech Republic, Russia, Portugal, Slovenia, and Bulgaria. Um, so just to situate uh, and to localize the, um, the Belgian uh, frame in the totality of the European uh, element. Here again, confidence in institutions, uh, uh, different sets of institutions in a European perspective, with the percentage only saying very strong confidence, um, the uh, left one is police, then the judicial system, then the parliament, and then the distinction is made between national and European parliament. Interesting from a European uh, perspective. Uh, as you can see, Belgium again is uh, towards the lower end, at least the people saying that they have a strong confidence, although it's very clear that the police uh, is attracting more confidence than the judicial system, very clearly. And in fact, if you look at that extreme left, um, color all the time in each of the countries, it would be very consistent. Uh, even in, in Finland, it's very prominent that the police attracts 45% of extreme trust, while the justice system uh, slightly under 25%. Also, Denmark shows the same trends, Holland, uh, and so on and so forth. So, strangely enough, there is a lot of consistency here that police uh, uh, attracts more confidence than the justice system. Interesting. Now, um, a couple of data on the criminal uh, justice area, and um, I will uh, keep an eye on the time here because it's uh, easy <coughs> to be carried away in this uh, interesting uh, debate. Um, the criminal justice system, of course, consists partly of uh, institutions and partly of uh, actors. And we were interested particularly in finding out how about the actors? What do people think about those who are really at the center of criminal justice? So here is are some data about the public prosecutors in the three sweeps. How do uh, people look at them? Uh, do they treat citizens equally? Well, here you have the data uh, from 41 up to 66. Definitely there is an increasing trend of confidence vis-a-vis uh, -vis the measure of equality being used by the public prosecutors. Do they have enough knowledge of the files they're treating uh, to make uh, adequate decisions? Also there, there is an, an increase uh, uh, interestingly enough. So you see it has been low in 2002, relatively low, we think, because we, we not, don't have comparative data from beforehand, but it is on the uh, increase. The same question with judges. Do they treat citizens uh, equally? Huh? It's on the rise here, definitely. And uh, do they have enough knowledge? It's also on the rise. Now, strangely enough here, the judges are regarded by the uh, public opinion to be a little bit less trustworthy, if 
if I may use that expression, because when it comes to comparing <coughs> the public prosecutors and the judges, as you can see, the public prosecutors are gaining a little bit more, not extremely uh, different kinds of levels of trust, but still a little bit more. And that is interesting, and also an interesting question. Why is it that the, the sitting judges who have to make decisions in criminal cases are regarded as less uh, attracting confidence or as uh, attracting less confidence vis-a-vis -vis the prosecutors who actually make a lot of decisions in either um, um, deciding to submit a case to court or to dismiss a case uh, from court. And here are lawyers. When I show this to lawyers, they're uh, up in arms because they don't like these uh, particular kind of figures. Uh, now, the, the level of knowledge is fairly well regarded, but the level of equal treatment seems to be a big problem, at least in the public perception. Yeah? Um, and the question is, what does that mean? Uh, is that based on reality? Is it based on experiences? Uh, is it based on uh, uh, ideology? Uh, who knows? It's very hard to actually pinpoint that. And I think th these are some of the limitations of this kind of research uh, because you cannot ask further questions. It would take too long and you would lose a lot of respondents. So that's why qualitative research comes in and could be useful to actually understand. Now, a final um, slide here on a uh, European perspective. This is about what people think are the highest chances to be found guilty in a European uh, perspective, that is to say, in various countries of Europe, whether rich people have a higher chance of being uh, found guilty. That's the, the yellow part. And as you can see, the yellow part on top is very, very small. Um, the green part is larger. Huh? Uh, namely, rich and poor people have equal chances of being treated uh, equally, and in other words, be found guilty if they uh, are guilty. And then the uh, purple part uh, says something about poor persons and the way in which the public opinion perceives the way in which they are treated. So here again, Denmark, Netherlands, Norway, Finland, Germany come out as countries where the population thinks that they have fairly equal chances or that uh, um, uh, poor people will not necessarily be disadvantaged uh, when they are found uh, guilty. Then a number of countries in between and again, you find Belgium there uh, in between. And then a number of countries, uh, uh, Poland, Hungary, uh, even Israel is, uh, is uh, taken into account here, the Czech Republic, Spain, Russia, Slovenia, Portugal. So Southern Europe and Eastern Europe uh, together, some of the new member states of the European Union and of the Council of Europe. Um, I think I'm going to pass on this one, given the time, but let me briefly um, introduce or, or, or mention uh, these experiences still, because uh, I was suggesting that this is a very important factor uh, to deal with. And for example, here, uh, this is the kind of questions uh, that were asked. What do you think of the outcome of the last case that you were involved in? If at all you were involved in one, civil justice, criminal justice. Um, positive <coughs> opinions range 51% in civil justice cases and uh, some say, well, that's normal. There is al always one that wins and one that loses, right? So it would be half-half. That could be an explanation. Very consistent in 2007. Um, when it comes to criminal justice, that's far less the case. Uh, uh, let's say one-third, and uh, also in 2007, has positive opinions about the outcome of the last case. When it comes to the way in which your last case was dealt with, uh, here we're trying to hint at procedural justice issues, basically, the way of being treated during uh, the case. Uh, here you have again uh, to the right civil, uh, excuse me, criminal justice, roughly speaking the same, and civil justice under this uh, 50%. So the way in which people are treated apparently attracts less uh, trust or less positive opinions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the way uh, the outcome of the case has been. Um, to uh, go towards the, uh, the conclusion of, uh, of my presentation, I would like to first to make some comparative remarks and then briefly dwell upon um, uh, some policy issues. Uh, some comparative remarks. So you see a lot of um, similarities between countries, definitely in Europe. Uh, I want to stress this is, uh, this is Europe. Uh, France, Spain, and Switzerland, but even outside, at least Canada, shows very remarkably similar uh, results. And we were able to, um, to bring those results to the fore through a conference in 2003 
where we actually uh, presented the results of the Belgian barometer and also were able to attract these uh, comparative perspectives through colleagues in different parts. Um, now, there is also um, the issue, of course, that how to compare all these different results. As I was suggesting in the beginning, it is uh, for the moment completely impossible to have a pan-European perspective. We have all these data, but many of them have been collected in different ways. And so um, and this, that's the reason why I mentioned this particular project uh, of Eurojustice, it's called, where Mike Huff and John Jackson are involved in uh, from the UK and many others in the, on the European continent. Uh, and this is an effort to actually build a database which is using exactly the same methodology, is using exactly the same questions, and therefore will produce results that at least can be compared. It will not be the same results, they will depend according to the country, but at least they will be collected in the same way and they can be compared. And I think that's a major breakthrough uh, um, for this kind of research, which always was, uh, was very much hampered by these, uh, these incomplete uh, data. Um, but again, one of the, the fundamental layers, the fundamental findings is always that the police is attracting higher levels of confidence than the criminal uh, justice system. And then here are still a number of uh, strong determinants uh, in, uh, in the kinds of research that uh, we have been able to conduct. Again, very much in line with European findings. The social position of the respondents is of high uh, value. Huh? The education, for example, or the income. Um, and we think it doesn't uh, only influence the attitude vis-a-vis -vis the justice system, but vis-a-vis -vis institutions in general. Huh? It's the kind of level uh, in institutions, in society in general, that may be at stake more than just uh, the justice system in the, in, the, in the narrow sense of the word. Um, the level of knowledge is very important, but here it strongly decreases on the basis of negative experiences uh, as said. We tend to think that the media play a very important role in this. However, we're not very sure in which way the direction is going because you might as well say that a person who is more highly educated, who has a better job, is drawn towards certain types of media, rather than saying that those media will influence the particular uh, opinion. So uh, I'm really curious uh, to find out what, uh, what your results here uh, have been in that respect. And um, yes, I will leave that until the discussion round. Very briefly, on the empirical cycle, there have been some uh, qualitative researchers uh, in Belgium and also in other parts of Europe to deal with a, f a fuller, a deeper understanding, let's say. For example, uh, based on this justice barometer, a couple of years later, uh, the same groups, uh, same academic groups of Leuven and Jerz have been able to conduct uh, qualitative research in four judicial districts. These were two districts in the north, one that came out the best and one that came out the worst and two judicial districts in the south of the country uh, <coughs> along the same line. And trying to understand more uh, what do people think, uh, and not only what do they think, but also why do they think what they think. Um, and there's a, a huge clash usually that comes out of these uh, focus groups, uh, uh, interviews and, uh, and, and talks about the ideal of justice and the justice system as it runs, and particularly the role of the lawyers, again. Um, which are regarded as um, uh, it's not always uh, very helpful uh, to promoting the cause of justice. Um, so here is another range of uh, researches with particular communities in this case, immigrant communities, for example, from North Africa and Turkey, with really in-depth interviews, 120, that's quite a bit, and uh, it took uh, three years to complete that research. Um, and here, again, there's a lot of gap, it seems to say. That's a traditional uh, issue in criminal justice and in sociology of law, the gap between black letter law or the expectations that people may have law and the kinds of services that are actually delivered and the reality mostly of non-delivery of those services. Also, in these researches, the importance of negative experiences comes up very, very strongly. Um, so that's something definitely to look, uh, to look into. Final round is uh, some ideas uh, about policy making, and in fact, we have always tried to be in our own research uh, very careful. And I see that most of the colleagues who are doing this type of research are very careful in making bold statements. 
Um, but uh, they are careful in saying, well, it's the first step. Huh? We have to gather further data. We have to work more towards understandings rather than just the raw data in themselves. Um, so one idea could be to use this kind of research as a diagnostic instrument, let's say. Uh, it's like a thermometer, let's say, of society, or a barometer in this case. In fact, it's a better word because it's less precise, of course. Uh, barometers do change over time, as weather barometers uh, also do. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a form of instrument that uh, gives an indication on which direction uh, trust is going and satisfaction is going and attitudes are going towards the uh, justice system. It could also be an, an aid, a uh, helpful instrument, uh, to develop further tools of assessment. Uh, tools of assessment uh, relating to individual issues, for example, or particular issues. Uh, for example, the issue of the length of proceedings, which always comes up in all kinds of uh, researches. Uh, people are very dissatisfied with lengths of proceedings um, or in the way in which they are treated. Maybe there can be more specific types of assessment tools that could be developed on the basis uh, of uh, this research because the research at least is hinting at some of the core problems, some of the key issues related to um, the justice system, at least, again, in the perception of the public opinion. Uh, here, of course, uh, the, the third element is about comparative research, huh? and this has partly been filled, let's say, this void by this European project. However, the European project is uh, not collecting data in all of the 28 member states of the, of the European Union, and definitely not in all of the 48 member states of the Council of Europe. It is only dealing with some states uh, for the moment, uh, developing the framework, uh, seven or eight, I think uh, it is, and then in the, the next round will actually be a general sweep that would uh, cover all of the countries uh, of Europe. And finally, we think it's an interesting device to be serving as the start of a discussion, a social or political uh, dialogue. Uh, just to give you one small example, um, a couple of years after the first results of this uh, barometer came out, um, when uh, government negotiations were held and the issue of juvenile delinquency was on the table, and um, some ministers, uh, or uh, well, negotiators, uh, then to later to be ministers, um, referred to the, uh, to the results of the barometer by saying, look, uh, people uh, think about juvenile delinquency in this way, that they want harsher punishments. Now, strangely enough, this was not what the barometer had said. The barometer had <laughs> exactly delivered exactly the opposite. People want harsh punishments, but with a lot of um, accompanying measures to actually let the juveniles reintegrate in society, to make sure there's rehabilitation, reintegration, and so on. Don't lock them up without further ado. Uh, bring them back in society, but nevertheless, uh, point at their accountability, their responsibility for the types of acts they have conducted. So this is interesting. It's a debate, obviously, but it's also a debate of how um, research results can be used, in this case even be manipulated uh, for policy reasons, or maybe I should say for political reasons, because policy and politics uh, are different things. Um, but it, uh, it is interesting to see how research results get translated uh, and conveyed in that particular vein uh, in societies. And here I couldn't resist bringing this one to the fore. I don't know if you have heard one this one before. Timothy Flanagan, who was one of the speakers at our conference and a well-known public opinion researcher, uh, uh, politicians tend to use the results the same way they use a lamppost hmm, for support. Hmm. Uh, but even that is uh, tricky because that support may not always be there. Um, I don't think I need to go into all of that. Here are some suggestions for deepening the research agenda uh, and for refining certain elements, confidence, trust, is that the same? Is it something different? I still have a hard time understanding the difference despite all the efforts of my uh, British colleagues to explain that. Uh, legitimacy, is that something different? Procedural justice and legitimacy, where do they interact? Um, I think the need for comparative methodology very strongly comes out of this uh, kind of research and we're making headway there, but there's a long way to go. And of course, the whole idea of that relationship between policy and uh, justice uh, as such in public opinion is a very intriguing and very interesting one. Uh, so I'm sure uh, we will have an interesting uh, discussion uh, at the end uh, of the morning session. Thank you so much for your, uh, your attention.